That's why I saw foot in the door. I wasn't quite sure. And my thing was, this is what I can do here. What can I do? You can get cardiothoracic surgery, you can get plastic surgeries, you can get a whole bunch of different things. Surgical wise, in the capital, no issue. As far as development of facilities, we don't want to develop new ones. We want to take the ones that are there, perhaps even consolidate a few. And then after that, and there's always, I've heard the saying, form follows function. What really struck me was the former director, he would have a weekend once a month where staff and family and friends would come to do maintenance on the clinic. This is Maestro Minute, the show that discusses all things real estate, sharing interviews with the most successful people in the industry. Hear from their perspective and what they are doing to achieve success. Get exclusive tips on how you can also succeed in real estate. Maestro Minute is brought to you by Maestro Development. Here's your host, Nareg Muradian. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining another episode of the Maestro Minute. Today, we have an exciting interview with Dr. Dara Marian. Thanks for joining us. Pleasure Good mine. to see you. Thank you for having me. So today, we're going to talk a little bit about healthcare development, specifically outside the U.S. But before we get there, doctor, why don't you give us a quick introduction? Tell us a little bit about yourself, kind of your journey in life to get to, to, get to where you've been today. Sure. Let's go from there. Pleasure. Pleasure. So I'm currently a pediatrician with about 25 years of practice. My journey uh, to become a physician started in childhood. Like all of us, our life experiences form us. We want to do, gives us purpose and meaning and drive. Graduate USC, undergrad, went to St. George's University School of Medicine. That was an amazing experience. And then came back, uh, did my pediatric residency in MLK. King Drew, that was quite experience as well. And after that, just, you know, life took me to work at Kaiser Permanente and the family progressed along. But along that journey, a couple of notches back, right after college, I was a pre-med, so I had an opportunity to go to Armenia. Uh, this is after 91, so after the whole breakup. And my purpose there was to gather information to better direct medical resources and personnel going to Armenia. It was an amazing opportunity, just kind of fell into it. So this is in 91? 92, I went. 92? Right. This was when Armenia was, the Soviet Union had already fallen. Just broken up. Just broke broken up. 91. Up. Okay. I actually got in 91 with my father. He, he's an engineer, electrical engineer. He went back because he studied in Armenia to try to help. So same idea, he ran there to kind of see what he could do to help. 92, I went, and I worked out of the AUA, American University mm -hmm. of Armenia. And I went through the country, not the whole country, but quite a bit of it, trying to get a sense of where things are, get information. And needless to say, it was heartbreaking to see where people were, what was going on. And also, the medical system there was really kind of falling apart. And each place I went to, they kind of looked to me for help except I was not there to help. I was there to gather information. But they didn't see that way, and they kind of felt at some point a sense of guilt that I couldn't help. One very striking example that I'll never forget, uh, I was in the pediatric neuro neurosurgery hospital, and I was talking to the director of the hospital, and he said they were using their scalpels. They would resharpen them and re-sterilize them to use it for pediatric neurosurgery, team, which is would be unheard of anywhere else. And going there, I had actually grabbed a packet of scalpels. I did a lot of um, kind of like first aid stuff uh, in un undergrad. So I gave that to him. And he said, thank you so much. He goes, well, what do I do after this is gone? And that really made me take a pause. And I told him, I said, I'm sorry, I'm not here to try to help. This is the best I have. So my intention was always to go back and answer that with, here's how I can help. So for years after I started practice, I looked for ways how I can go back. And there's a little bit of a disorganization, not a cohesive sense of one place you can go say, hey, I want to help and kind of jump into it. It became very difficult, very frustrating, until a point I actually gave up. And I took my family to Armenia. Well, let me ask you this. What was frustrating? Was it the lack of organization, what, what made it frustrating? Uh, what was frustrating was, in, in a simple sense, wherever I called, reached out to, um, they had some bureaucracy or some other agenda, and 
And I said, listen, I'm a pediatrician. I literally want to come there and help. And there was no response, which I thought was kind of crazy. But then always kind of take a step back in situations, kind of read it for what it is, not judge it. And I thought maybe they just don't have it together enough to be able to do something like this. So I finally always wanted to take my family to Armenia. It was 2018. So I took him there, had an amazing three weeks. And before I left, uh, one of my good friends, he knew my intentions all these years. He said, hey, there's a guy named Peter Abadjian. Why don't you reach out to him when you get there? So the last three or four days we had off free time, we literally traveled through the whole country. Artsakh, Shushi, Ar Armenia, everywhere. And um, I gave him a call. And I said, hey, I said, you know, we tried to, friend of John gave me your number. He was really busy. He's like, hey, what are you doing for dinner? Let's meet. So we met for dinner. He had a service Armenian group coming in. We were having dinner, just kind of getting to know each other. And I reached out and said, how can I help? And his response is, I'll see you back at 7 in the morning. I'll show you how. So 7 in the morning, picked me up. We drove to Gumri. He has a program there. So in two days, I, hit, I did something like 160 physicals on kids. Now, these are not complete physicals in the Western standard, but something they didn't have. So it's pretty exhausting, but very rewarding. So when I got done there, came back with just, you know, plans just going in my head what to do next. And I asked Peter, I said, what's your intention? He said, to bring Western standard of medicine to Armenia. Not necessarily Western style or philosophy, but Western standards. So in Armenia, there are no standards, right? There's no, there's no CDPH, there's no licensing. Right. right. So it's the old fo former Soviet kind of system, but there's no system. Is that correct? Somewhat. So during the Soviet era, there was certain licensing and standards, and you had to graduate medical school, certifications. All, so there was a certain standard that had during the Soviet Union. When the Soviet Union collapsed, that kind of fell apart. Kind of like a semi-free-for-all. There was no really kind of guidance in that. They are reorganizing that. They are now... Again, bringing the Western standards of having board certification, licensing, and so forth. And this has its challenges. They're going through the same process we went through in the 1920s. 1920s, in the US, you can open up shop as a physician, quote unquote, anywhere. So they need to get a handle on that, you know, quality, you know, knowledge base, and all those things. So that's basically what they're doing. So in Gumri, you were there. You, that's where you saw, here's how I can help. That's where I saw foot in the door. I wasn't quite sure. And my thing was, this is what I can do here. What can I do? So and as I did that, I wanted to see, explore, see where can I go with this. And over the five years, it was just basically year after year going back and trying to learn, understand where that next door is, what can be done. So just maintaining those, you know, going from Gimri and then expanded to another little village called Baru Sevag, another center in Yerevan. So, and I just went to these places, it was more of a learning process and a giving process. To coming back to that first year, we were on a, so while I was doing those physicals, my two kids, my wife, were kind of absorbed into the service Armenia project. When I got back, I'm seeing photos of them shoveling gravel, doing construction work, all this stuff. And I thought, wow. So on the plane back, we were flying back. I always do the roses and thorns kind of thing, what was good, what was bad. I said, what was your favorite part of this whole three weeks? I'm thinking, we had an amazing trip to Armenia, and they're like the last three days. And that really was very profound for me. So even kids want to find meaning and purpose in what they're doing. And I said, that's it. Sir. So every year we're coming back until they grow from this, I grow from it, see what I can do. So as I've been doing this, um, through uh, Peter's guy help, I mean, he is the access to everything I do, uh, Powers Foundation. We started venturing different places, seeing, understanding what's going on. We finally came across a polyclinic called Norhajim. And unique, what was unique about them is location. It was about 30 minutes north of Yerevan. And they're very receptive, very um, dedicated staff. Other clinics are very dedicated, but there was a bit of a pride issue oftentimes. They had their, you know, goals and whatnot. So this is one place we came across. And from there, over the last three years, we've been working with them. And what started from, we need an x-ray machine. 
now has evolved into a complete elevating care in that clinic. So my mission has always been not necessarily to do mission work, like go there and see a few patients and go home, was to engage the assets in place, the resources in place, elevate their level, whatever amount that can be, so they can continue on a, a better health care. And part of this came, I was listening to a presentation, and in there, the data show that literally you were better off not going to a physician than going to a physician as far as the health outcome. Now that's scary. And this is pretty much primary care. Interesting enough, surgical sur specialties are Western standards through and through amazing, if not better, sometimes. You can get cardiothoracic surgery, you can get plastic surgeries, you can get a whole bunch of different things. Surgical-wise, in the capital, no issue. Outside of that, primary care, a lot of work to be done. Is that because there's more revenue on surgeries? Is that Absolutely. why it's like that? Absolutely. So there's not a lot of revenue on primary care. So you started focusing on that, specifically this one clinic. What was the name of the clinic? Norhagen. Norhagen. And what are we doing with that? Is there something going on with Norhagen now? Yes, definitely. So coming to your first question, as far as finding the resource for that, it's no different than here in the U.S. We struggle with that here as well. Preventive care is a tough thing to uh, encourage. Many different models have been tried to try to a reimbursement model so that to encourage physicians and patients yeah. to engage in preventive care and primary care. So it's nothing novel as far as that challenge. So in Norhajan, what's going on with there is I have been very fortunate, and I kind of call it luck, but I, I think it's not luck. It's just a matter of the time you spend. I've come across people with similar energy, with similar passion and engagement, who are doing amazing work. And we're pretty much engaging the clinic at every level. Um, our intention is phys physician education, culture change, engaging the physicians so they see benefit to themselves as well, their quality of life, and also see that what they're doing is actually have impact. The concept of population care or outcome-based isn't quite there. It's more like just uh, putting out fires, and the outcome from that necessarily is not a issue at hand. So getting them resources as far as equipment, the knowledge and how to run the clinic. And I always ask them, it's like, why do you do what you do? And the usual answer is, well, that's the way it's always been done. Nothing unique over here too, right? We do things like, that's just the way we always do it. And I've learned humility in the sense of, when I talk to them, you have to understand that they're at a homeostasis. They're doing the best that they can with what they have and what they know. Right. And one has to really appreciate and respect that. And that respect and, and empathy has to be the forefront driver when you engage them. So with that, I'm trying to bring in preventive care, lifestyle medicine, which would be kind of unheard of. But really, if you engage the population at large, like you're in a city in an apartment, you didn't start here. Let's look back at your grandparents who lived in the villages, they were healthier. Why don't we try to adopt that level of uh, lifestyle? So at this point, we're still in the building phase. A lot of amazing people are working, helping to get resources as far as uh, goods. But I'm trying to do this in a sustainable fashion. So I don't want someone just to write a million dollar check and say, here, do this all, because it's not sustainable. It's sustainable in the sense that I want it to be homegrown. So if I give them a piece of equipment, there's a few things with that. First is, are you able to maintain it? Are you able to sustain its use? The second is the cost of the equipment. If I can prove that it is going to give a payback, then will the government for the next clinic buy that or put that resource in knowing that the return on investment is going to be huge. So with this clinic, new equipment, it's an existing old Soviet clinic, right? Correct. So it has all these needs. Um, you're trying to prove to the government the return on equipment on the investment of what they're going to put in the space? Ultimately. Ultimately. So, so that's maybe about two, three years down the road, once to get up and running. And not just the government, but anyone at large. Right. Who, whatever program or entity would be at play, so they could see through right. publications, 
uh, through just evidence-based. And you want to prove that what you're doing is working. I've been to Armenia a few times and I've noticed that there is a lot of digital imaging spaces, a lot of MRIs and CTs being built out, maybe too much. And you're right, there's not a lot of uh, primary care um, facilities and opportunities for people to go there, right? For whatever reason that you've been describing. So when you're trying to develop healthcare in Armenia, what are some of the challenges that you're seeing with, with the renovation of spaces out there? That's an excellent question. So there are way too many hospitals and clinics. So if you look at the demographic in the U.S. and L.A., and you compare it to Armenia, they have like 10, 20-fold number of clinics and hospitals. So what is the problem with that? I'm going to get to that last question. The problem with that is that you're spreading thin resources. You need a certain volume of experience to become good at what you do. So in Kaiser, we actually consolidated certain centers to elevate the number of patients in those centers to maintain an excellent level of skill set. Because if you're only seeing five or 10 patients, as opposed to 30, 40, you're not going to have the same level of skill set. And then your per unit expense your expenses for what you're doing are going to be much higher. So uh, you're saying there's too many facilities in Armenia? Yes. Correct. And there's right, not enough skilled that. support for them? Depends. If surgical, there is, obviously. But otherwise, below the specialty surgicals that are out of pocket, yes, they do, they do struggle. Definitely. As far as development of facilities, we don't want to develop new ones. We want to take the ones that are there, perhaps even consolidate a few, and then after that, and there's always, I've heard the saying, uh, form follows function. So you want to bring the function and the workflow and all those things in. So one of my intentions in Norhajan is to change the workflow. So for example, a physician and a nurse are in one room. The patient comes in there, the processing is in there. They sit in there with the physician. And everything that happens with that physician happens in that room. People walk in and out, phone calls come in. It's very inefficient, lack of privacy. The yeah. whole culture and workflow is not very, it's very old Soviet. So imagine like we have here, you have three rooms for the, for, for, for physician, for patients. You have your little office, you take care of your stuff there and you go see the patients as the nurses process through them. You get a lot better turnover and workflow. So first I need to bring in that organization, that workflow in, so they can see. And then, then we can start changing the physical facility to be able to accommodate that. And what have you experienced with, with the actual renovations or, or changes with the facilities or equipment, right? When you're doing that, I mean, here, there's certain expectations, codes, regulations, and then obviously operational requirements. But over there, um, this is kind of a, you know, it's a different ball game out there, right? As far as the renovations go, you're basically polyclinics, primary care, have almost zero budget to do anything. Actually, this clinic, what really struck me was the former director, he would have a weekend once a month where staff and family and friends would come to do maintenance on the clinic. Yeah. No pay, nothing, which is amazing. But then we were in Gyumri, and we can go visit the hospital in Gyumri. The Gyumri is the second biggest city in Armenia. And I was kind of curious what I was going to see. It's like I went to Glendale Aventis, yeah. if not better. So I was pretty shocked. But again, the tertiary level of care, the specialty care, all those things are the money generating, all those things. And interesting enough, I met with the Minister of Health one time, superb lady, she truly gets it. And I, after discussion, and I said, why don't we bring Kaiser model here, you know, pre preventive care. And she nodded and she said, yes, that would be great, but there's a big journey to get there. So she understands, but she has quite a work ahead of her to do that. So where do you see the future of healthcare in Armenia? There's a lot of needs and a lot of development opportunity. <clears throat> where do you see that going? It's almost like changes by the week. And uh, as I learn about and I see amazing people doing great work, I see them making the same progress we made here, but faster. They really, there's a lot of dedicated, practical people on the ground. So I'm hoping that next 10, 20 years, you have to think long term. We have to stop this next year deal or next week deal. If you think of the next 10 years to bring standardization, quality, our universal health care, 
I think it's very much doable. And I think the ball's in motion in that direction, and it will get there. Uh, people just have to see the long game and sustain and maintain that vision and the effort. It's rushing yards, no Hail Marys. Right. And um, so, but I do, I, I do see, when I say hope, I don't want to seem like hopes and prayers. I say hope based on what I'm seeing, that in about 10 years, we're going to see a significant difference. And I see that because I see people on the ground dedicated. There's now a pediatric residency program that started there. There's an emergency medicine residency program. Those sort of been unheard of concepts two, three years ago. So now they're really, truly starting. And that ground level up is going to force the rest of that space to really shift and start falling into line. Yeah. Do you, do you see an adaptation to the Western style or European or Russian model? I think they're shooting more for European. European. It's a little bit different standards. I mean, people going there doing this work are U.S., and they're very much in global health, so they are not trying to be very rigid as far as what they do there, taking local resources, what is doable, what is not, you know, meeting halfway. Perfect is the enemy of good, so you want to be good, you don't have to be perfect. Right. So, but yes, so they're making quite a bit of progress there. Well, it's super exciting to hear what's happening with healthcare in Armenia, Dr. Garamarian. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Excited to see what happens in the next year, especially the next, like you said, it's the long, long play, not the short play. Appreciate you coming in and sharing with our viewers what's happening in Armenia. It's a pleasure. Thank Good you very much, you. Really. Thank you, everybody, for watching this episode of Maestro Minute. Hope you guys enjoyed today's uh, interview. And uh, we'll see you on the next one. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for tuning in to the Maestro Minute podcast. Make sure to rate this podcast if you found it helpful, share it with a friend that could use it, and follow us on all major podcast platforms. The Maestro Minute, powered by Maestro Development.